Paul came to Derby and then to live screen where this disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, who, uh, whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystria and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted him to take, along, take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who, knew, who lived in that area, for they knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions preached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew in numbers daily. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, have been, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Tros. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, as we uh, continue in the book of Acts today, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of background, um, because as we've been going through the book of Acts, um, we tend to think that maybe the, the, the timeline, we really don't get the timeline in our head, uh, what's happening in this passage in, chap in chapter 16 here is only about 30 years after Jesus began his ministry. So this, this is about 60 A.D. Uh, Jesus, you know, uh, about 30 A.D. was, was uh, crucified around that time. And so it's only about 60 years that have passed, and we've seen uh, this movement of following Jesus from 12 guys and, and a, you know, a few other disciples that are were fishermen and virtually unknowns, now the, the same gospel started by those guys is moving throughout the Roman Empire. So within 30 years, uh, a lot has been happening. And I, I want to emphasize that because I think in our day and age, we think it, for anything of, of significance in our life, for God to do anything, it takes a long time. And some things it does. It takes a, it's a, a long road. But God can do some ma pretty amazing things in short periods of time if we give ourselves fully to him. And you see this in these uh, missionaries and these apostles. When they gave their lives fully to the gospel, God began to do some amazing things. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we uh, jump into uh, Acts chapter 16. Uh, Father, we are here today once again to, uh, to explore your word uh, because we know that contained within your word are the words of life. That it, it is alive and it cuts us to the heart and it can... It can transform us. It can convict us. It can, it can do the work uh, that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. So, Father, we're here not only to, to learn some knowledge, but we want to be transformed uh, by your word, by the power of your spirit that is moving among us today. And so, Father, open our eyes to see these things anew, maybe for the first time, maybe to relearn them, uh, maybe to unlearn some things, God, that we've had wrong over the years as well. Uh, Father, whatever you decide to do among us today, we welcome it, for you are God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we uh, go through this, again, kind of, I was brought up in a, kind of the Baptistic tradition, and we had um, this, almost kind of this unspoken dividing line between missionaries and everybody else that was a Christian, right? And so missionaries were those who were like these special people that were sent to foreign countries, and, and they're kind of set apart, and then everybody else is just a normal Christian. Um, that dividing line is it shouldn't be there every christian is on mission right so every one of us is a missionary so whether we're called to be a missionary to a neighbor across the street to take the mission to a person across the street or to a, a different culture it's the same process of giving ourselves to jesus for whatever he wants to do through us so just understand as i talk about this passage today there are some principles for missions that I don't want you to just think that's for the people that go overseas. It's for you and me as well. So the first thing I want to look at is the first mission principle, and it's this thing here, becoming all things for the sake of the gospel. Uh, we'll kind of go through it, and then we'll kind of explain it. So let me read the scripture again. This is verses 1 through 5 of chapter 16. Uh, remember, Paul has left behind Barnabas. He's taken Silas, and he's gone off to Asia. Barnabas has gone to Cyprus. They're separated ways now. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. 
The believers at Livestream and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. And so Paul and Silas and the team, they go, and they're going to the cities that Paul had previously preached to uh, with Barnabas, and churches were established there. And they're strengthening those churches, and they're also telling the churches what the council in Jerusalem said, that it's salvation by grace alone, that the law has nothing to do with it, works have nothing to do with it, you don't have to become a Jew before you become a Christian, it's simply by faith in Jesus. And just kind of give you again a little bit of context here, um, that this is not just myth, it's not just kind of stories that kind of impart spiritual truths to us, that this is, this is history, just the next clip here, Josh. Um, this is Derby, um, it's a, basically a hill. Uh, very little excavation has been done there, um, and that's pretty much, if you went there, you would see. There's really not a lot of buildings. If you went on top of the mound there, you would see you know, broken pottery scattered around, maybe some you know, uh, pieces of marble from uh, some monumental structures, but not much else. Remember, Derby, backwater town, probably most of the buildings were built out of you know, wood and stone and not, not a lot of stuff that would be... Uh, remain the, the stone would have been reused by other cultures and other towns so derby isn't very impressive today neither was it very impressive in paul's day it was a backwater town next one is uh lystra a uh, little bigger but all we have today is just again a mound the reason you have mounds is because cities had to build be built on the same place so you build your city near a a, um, a road where there would be trade or water source and so as one city was destroyed by war or whatever else reason, famine, earthquake, they would build on top of it and build on top of it and build on top of it. So what you'd get would be a mound or a tell. And so Leicester was built many, many times from uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, pre-Stone Age period all the way up to the, to the uh, I think, I believe the Ottoman period. So many, many cities. But again, it's just not a lot of excavation done, just a, uh, just a hill. If you went on top of the hill, you'd see something like this. Next clip there, Josh. It's just a piece of stone. There's, there's not, again, not a lot left. But if you were to excavate that, you would see uh, layers and layers and layers of the cities that Paul and Silas and Barnabas ha had went to as well. Uh, next next uh, slide. This is a, a typical Roman road uh, in the Derby area. So as Paul and his team would have walked throughout Asia Minor, this is basically what they would have walked on, right? For miles and miles and miles and miles. And you can see uh, uh, potentially how dangerous it would be, right? Robbers could hide anywhere, right? So it wasn't only going to the cities where they would preach the gospel and then would be attacked by the people who didn't like the gospel, stoned and thrown into the city, but they were constantly in danger from robbers and thieves and brigands that would uh, be in the area as well. And so they uh, travel from east to west this time. Paul and Silas, they arrive at Lystra, and they arrive at Derby, and they encounter this young man named Timothy in Lystra. And uh, Timothy stands out to Paul. Uh, it seems that, that his mother was a believer, probably maybe saved during Paul's previous missionary journey. Uh, his father just says he was Greek, probably meaning an unbelieving Greek. So his father was an unbelieving Greek, and his mother was a Jew. And uh, a grandmother was also Jewish, and so they were brought up to, he was brought up to know the Scriptures. Even before he probably came to Christ, he was brought up uh, as a Jew to know the scriptures. So these two ladies, along with Timothy, uh, probably again came to faith when Paul uh, was there the first time. Now Timothy <clears throat> apparently displayed tremendous spiritual maturity. And as a result, uh, Paul desired that the young man accompany him in Silas the missionary. He says, this guy, this guy Timothy, he, he has some maturity here as a young man and who would be helpful on our journey. He doesn't really give a whole lot of details as why, just saw some maturity in him, and so Timothy is, is about to go with Paul for the rest of this journey. Now, Timothy is mixed race. He's Jew and, and Gentile, and for some reason, he was not circumcised as an infant. Uh, Jewishness was uh, reckoned through the mother's line rather than the father's line, so for all intents and purposes, uh, Timothy was a Jew in the minds of the people around him, and so Timothy became circumcised in order not to seem a Jew who had rejected God's covenant. 
And so if Timothy went around preaching the gospel to Jews and they knew he was a Jew and he wasn't circumcised, uh, that would have been a problem for, for the mission. Uh, if his parentage had been reversed, if his mother was a Greek and his father was a Jew, it wouldn't have mattered because Jews did not reckon their Jewishness through the patriarchal line, through, but through the matriarch. And so he would have been regarded as a Jew that wasn't fulfilling the covenant. And if this guy is not fulfilling the covenant, then why should I even listen to him with anything else he would say? And so Paul and Timothy, uh, Paul circumcised Timothy out of sensitivity to the Jewish audience, right? Just as uh, the council had said that the, these laws weren't uh, for salvation, but we should be considerate of the Jews who would be offended by the things that were done. So um, some argue that this kind of compromised what the Jerusalem council said because the law had nothing to do with it. Um, we see in the book of Galatians that Paul resisted circumcising Titus because he was just Greek. And so there was no reason to force Titus to be circumcised because nothing would have been, the Jews wouldn't have been offended by it. But the gospel was at stake here, and so Timothy's situation was different. Uh, Timothy was both Jew and Greek, and because rabbinic law said that all Jews should be circumcised, Paul knew that Timothy would have constantly offended every Jew that he walked into uh, by not being circumcised. And you might ask, well, how would they know? <laughs> right? How would they know? Yeah. Remember, in the ancient world, when you went to take a bath, you didn't have your private bath. You go to a public bath, right? You go to public baths where everybody would be in their natural state, and so this is kind of how they know, right? Because you weren't this. It was the nudity wasn't as restricted in this culture as it was in, in our in our culture, and so it would have came out eventually that that um, he was uh, ignoring the covenant, and so Timothy undergoes this painful surgery as an adult. Uh, so that he would not offend the Jewish community. So um, later on, what we see in, in some of Paul's writings, and actually when he writes to Timothy, Timothy's Jewish-Greek background actually becomes quite an asset later on as he can bridge both cultures. He now can be a Jew to Jew and a Greek to Greek because he is, he is accepted by both, and that becomes very effective for him uh, as he becomes uh, a pastoral leader later on. So generally, for Paul, circumcision was a matter of indifference. He, he didn't really care whether you were circumcised or not circumcised, as long as Gentiles were not being told that their salvation depended on it. He would adapt to anything as long as the reason for it was it, you, you're saved by it. So Paul didn't care whether you did you know, celebrate a, a, a Jewish ritual or a Gentile ritual, as long as it wasn't a requirement for salvation or, or sinful. And so Paul, in this passage, once again, we find this very basic missions principle that Paul championed. Now, albeit he made Timothy get circumcised, but you see this in Paul's life as well. Paul was willing to become all things to all people in order to reach them with the gospel. Paul was willing to sacrifice his comfort. Paul was willing to sacrifice his culture and his tradition, the things that mattered to him that were his opinion, things that just kind of were Paul's stuff. He was willing to sacrifice all that for the sake of the gospel message. That was his primary motivation. How can I get the gospel out to as many people as possible so they can hear and potentially respond to Jesus? And uh, he sacrificed everything. And this, is, this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as he actually wrote about this principle that you see portrayed here in this narrative. This is beginning in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9. He, Paul says this, uh, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. How does that resonate with you, right, as an American, right? I've made myself a slave to everyone. I'm willing to give up everything for the sake of the other person. Why? To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, it's not a requirement for salvation as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, all possible means, I might save some. 
I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. And we'll get to that more later on in the application. So, Paul wanted to adapt to different cultures as much as he could without changing the gospel, without changing the core of the gospel message. So, as long as adapting doesn't mean adapt, adopting a sinful action, we should be willing to adapt. We should be willing to change, to, to sacrifice our wants and our likes for others. Um, we should be willing to give up certain cultural customs that we have that are important to us because our family or how we grew up or whatever it might be for the gospel. Our goal uh, isn't to press our culture onto another culture, but to press the gospel into that culture, right? So it's understood by them. So if people reject your ministry, if people reject you when you share the gospel, Make sure that the stumbling block they reject is the gospel. It's not your cultural biases. It's not your politics. It's not your personal practices. Those things, if those are a stumbling block, just shut up. Just don't talk about them. Be quiet about them. Uh, reject them. Uh, put no stumbling block in way of the gospel. The only stumbling block there should be is the gospel itself. But, don't compromise the truth, right? So adapt, but don't compromise. I don't usually name names, but this guy is so famous that I, I, I do want to talk about him. Have you all heard of Max Licato? Yes. Right? He's like the Baptist Pope, right? He's the Baptist Pope. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed in him because Max is trying to adapt, right, to culture. But I think he went too far. He's actually speaking at a conference for uh, affirming and welcoming Christians, people. Christians who believe that homosexuality is okay, that the Bible does not condemn it. And he's actually at that conference as a keynote speaker. Um, this is, I, I think he went over the, the bounds here. He's gone from, I want to reach people. I want to kind of not be judgmental. I want to kind of get rid of my culture, my preconceived notions that might be my stuff. And, and I want to adapt so I can preach the gospel. But in that, he's put a stamp of approval on that conference, and I think he stepped over the bounds. That's my opinion, if you want to discuss with me that. But I give that as an example because we're all in that danger, right? We, we can, um, we can uh, say, I'm going to uh, adapt here, but then we end up doing things that are sinful, right? So we've got to be very careful we don't cross over the line. But we also have to be careful that we're not, not so timid that we don't even adapt. We just we kind of put the walls around us, and we don't interact with people. We don't take a chance. Right with uh, with the gospel, so it's a balance here. We'll talk about that when we get to the end here. What that looks like. So Paul and Silas and Timothy now, they continue on their journey. They they visit churches. They're reporting to all those churches and, and new places they're visiting. What the council in Jerusalem said about the gospel. Uh, so they go through these arduous trips, these, these rugged mountains, these dangerous areas, for two years or more, out of love for Jesus and the church and the people that God has sent them to. And, and as a result of the effort, that the churches are strengthened, and some amazing things begins to happen, and the gospel goes further and further and further and reaches people after people after people, uh, all different types of people groups and all different types of tribes. First mission principle is coming all things to all people. The ability to, without compromising the truth, adapt so we can be more effective in preaching the culture, to give up things in order that the gospel might be manifested and, and magnified. Second mission principle in this passage is reliance on the Spirit and not on self. Verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to en enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas, and during the night, Paul had a vision of a man standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So this is the uh, map here. It's the second missionary journey. Uh, they have left Jerusalem. That's the green part on the far right. And they've gone back to Antioch. And that's where at Antioch, Barnabas goes to Cyprus, the island off the coast there. But Paul and Silas continue up through Asia Minor. 
The first place it's, the scripture says they go to a place called Galatia and Phrygia, which is in this one click there, Josh. And so we see that they're in this kind of this upper area north of city in Antioch. And they're in that area that says that the Holy Spirit kept them from preaching there. And so they move down uh, to this area, kind of down or up, depending on where you are in the, uh, the, uh, the province, to Asia, next click, which is right above Phrygia. And they're in that area, and at that point, uh, it says that they, uh, that this, again, the Spirit pulls them there, so they go, they go more west to Myasia. And again, they can't go anywhere because at Myasia, they, uh, they're, they're held back against, so they try to go to Bithynia, way up north, and that doesn't work out either for whatever reason. Uh, and there's no churches, they haven't been there before, at least no churches that Paul had, had taught. So they go back down to a city called Troas, next clip, uh, which is near Troy, you all familiar with Troy, right? The ancient, that same city, different time. Troy was the ancient Bronze Age, now we're in the, the uh, Roman period. And in Troas, they have, uh, Paul has this vision of a man from Macedonia, which is across the Aegean Sea, one more click, there. And you see the, the pathway that they're going to take on the, the second missionary journey throughout this, this area we'll be going through as we go through the book of Acts. So somewhere along the way, the trip to strengthen the churches became a new missionary venture. They were just planning to go to the places they already been to strengthen the churches. But God has something else planned. They try to go to different areas, and you see the Spirit of God, or the Spirit of Jesus, or God himself, begins to direct them. So this new missionary adventure is not due to careful strategic planning, but because of divine leading. They didn't get to Antioch and go, where do you think we should go? Well, I heard there's a big synagogue in here. Let's go there. There's no strategic planning. They just try to go someplace, and God says, no, not there, this way. And they go that way, and God says, no, and they go this way, no, and until it's kind of wound down. It's kind of one of those things like in the old carnivals, you know, you, there's all the pins in it, and you put the ball on top. And he goes, ding, 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 until it finds the hole. That's kind of, they're going, bing, 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 until it gets them where they, where God desires them to go. And so they travel to the region of Phrygia and Galatia, uh, or it could be the Phrygian region of the province of Galatia, that area there. It's kind of, could be either. Um, and they try to preach there. They try to preach in Asia, but they're kept by doing so from, by the Holy Spirit. Not a lot of explanation. Again, they try to go to Bithynia, and then it says the Spirit of Jesus would not not allow them to go. So they go back to this city called Troas, and they get direct leading there. So it's the first time there's direct leading. It's not just a no, don't go there, but direct leading where Paul has this vision during the night. A man of Macedonia says, come and, and help us. Uh, so at this point, Paul concludes, this is not just a dream. This is not just something that happened in my head. This is actually something that God is doing. So they prepare to leave. And at this point, this is when Luke joins them. How do we know this is when Luke joins them? Because the scripture says, we got ready to leave. Right? That, this is the first time the word we is. Before it's Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas. At one point it says, uh, after Paul had seen the vision, we get ready at once to leave Macedonia. We know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. So now Luke joins them in Troas. And so they use that, uh, they go in from all, basically over to Macedonia. So the question is, how did the Spirit of God prevent them from going place to place? Did, did they receive visions? Did the Lord withdraw their sense of peace from going to that area? Did they just experience transportation? They tried to take the whatever they had back then to that north, and they just couldn't find safe transportation. It, it doesn't really tell us. It doesn't say anything. It could be did sickness hinder them. Did someone get sick? And that could have been a reason. We don't know. All we know is that somehow, in some way, God's Spirit blocked them. And so God may prevent us from doing certain things and going from going certain places in a whole host of different ways. So should doors close, don't despair. God's Spirit is still leading. There's always a leading of God's Spirit. So God, ultimately, what he was trying to do is get them to Macedonia without saying, from Antioch, go to Macedonia. He has, sometimes, the destination isn't all that God wants us to get to, right? It's the journey along the way. And the journey, sometimes, we learn more along the journey than the final destination God wants to get us to. So whatever the reason, God has taken us through all these different changes of plan until they get to uh, this, this call to Macedonia. Uh, a lot of people have uh, 
speculated who the man from Macedonia was. How did Paul know he was a man from Macedonia? Did he have a sign from Macedonia? Um, some have said it, maybe it was Alexander the Great, kind of representing Macedonia. We don't, we, again, we, we don't know um, why he, they knew he was from Macedonia. But regardless, Paul related this vision to Silas and Timothy, and they all agreed that God had purposed them to go to Macedonia to continue to build the church of Christ. And so all four men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, and maybe others, they set out to cross the Aegean Sea to uh, preach the gospel in Macedonia. There are a lot of unknowns in this passage, but the main point is clear. God is guiding the missionaries. That's the point. If you can't get anything else from this, God is the one that is guiding the missionaries. And remember I said at the beginning of the message, what are you? You're a missionary. And God will do the same for you and for I. On the side note, just as important to see here, notice that the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is involved here. Uh, the Holy Spirit prevented them to go to Asia. In verse 7, the Spirit of Jesus doesn't permit them to go. And later in verse 10, God the Father calls them to Macedonia. So you see the whole Godhead is at work here leading these, these missionaries. So what do we say in application? Just review some things. The first thing is this idea of becoming all things in application. Don't ever forget that salvation is by grace alone. You're not, served, you're not saved by works. You're saved by God's good favor to you, shown to you because of what Jesus did on the cross. The law has no bearing on our lives as a means for salvation. No bearing. Yet, Timothy is circumcised. See, in Christ, Paul was no longer bound to ceremonies, rituals, traditions of Judaism. And nor are we bound by any of those things of our religious traditions as well. Following or not following any of those things had no effect on Paul's spiritual life. But if following them would open a door for witnessing to the Jews, he would gladly accommodate. So if you can do something and adapt to open a door to reach a person that you otherwise couldn't reach, then do it. Whether it's compromising your cultural sensitivities, whether it's compromising your politics, whether it's compromising um, your, your family um, rituals and, and things you practice in home. Uh, see, what, for Paul, what had once been legal restraints now had become love restraints. He did them because, not because they were required out of the law requires it for salvation. He did it because love required it. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians, right? I'm under the law of Christ, the law of love. So I do it because I love these people, and, and if I don't show love to them, they're going to shut the door, and I can't preach the gospel, and they're going to be lost, and I can't deal with that. So I'm going to compromise everything, and I use that compromise in, in a good way, not a bad way, by the way. I compromise things that aren't important so that I can preach the gospel. So the principle is this. Adapt as much as you can in non-sinful ways. Adapt, and you can emphasize this, as much as as you can. Not as little as possible. Right? Adapt as much as you can. Because the more you adapt, the more God can use you. The more the stumbling blocks that might come up from who you are and what your opinions might be, what my opinions might be, fall by the wayside, and the gospel can get out more and more clearly. So we adapt as much as we can, but in non-sinful ways. Understand that don't cross that line. Don't adapt um, so if, if you um, like you know if you're gonna go to a, a bar because you you know you have a bunch of guys there that you know that that you know drink and you go and you, and they're getting smacked and you have a beer too that's fine you're you're adapting you're kind of fitting in whatever you want to do but you don't get drunk why because drunk is against the scriptures right so and if you can't go and then you don't if you can't do that and you can't maintain your sobriety then you you uh, don't go right so you need to know yourself. Your limitations are, and what you feel comfortable, according to your conscience, what is able to adapt. But you don't cross over into uh, sinful ways. Uh, in essence, Paul is telling us to live and act in ways that are different from the way we would act if we didn't share his goal in life. And so he's saying, what are your goals in life? What are you trying to do with your life? And then adapt your life so you can fulfill those goals. If you have different goals, you're not going to adapt. 
right? You're going to adapt for the goals that you have, right? So if you want to hang out with rich people, then you're going to adapt how you dress and who you hang out with to adapt with them, if that's your goal. But if your goal is what Paul, the goals that Paul has, then you're going to adapt to uh, reach those goals. So the question is, what are Paul's goals? Well, he tells us in that 1 Corinthians 9 passage. The first goal Paul has is to save others. Five times he says that his aim in adapting the way people, the way that people live is to win them. At the end of verse 22 in that 1 Corinthians passage, he says this, I have become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. He tells you what his goal is. I'm doing this so that people can be saved. He's not doing it for acceptance among the group because he wants to be accepted by a Greek society or by Jewish society. He wasn't doing it because it made him safer. He wasn't doing it for any other reason. He tells us he's doing it because he wants to save people. So that is why he adapts. So the calling for Paul to save others far outweighs anything else. The calling that Paul has in his life to save other people far outweighs anything else as far as importance. So his two questions kind of center us. Now, does your passion to lead people to Christ far outweigh all else? Does your passion for the things of God and his heart far outweigh all else? Or is there something in competition? And you can know this by how much you're willing to adapt and give up things that are our rights or our privileges or whatever it might be for the sake of the gospel. The calling to save others is a far outweigh anything else in your life. That's why Paul was willing to and able to adapt. That's why he loved to adapt. That's why he was effective in his mission. Because not only, remember, is Paul adapting, right, by giving up his Jewish privileges, but he also calls his team to adapt, too, by asking Timothy to be to circumcised. The second goal he has is to save others for us to save others. And he says in verse 23, he wants to be a partaker of the benefits of the gospel. So he wants to save others and partake in the benefits of the gospel. I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I may become a fellow partaker of it. In other words, uh, Paul knew that his faith in Christ would be utterly inauthentic and false if he abandoned the, the pattern or the practice of life set by Jesus and he no longer cared for people. If Paul wanted to benefit from the gospel, he had to love people. He had to care for them, just like Jesus did, just like Jesus gave up things for the sake of us, right? That he who knew no sin became sin for us. Uh, the, again, the Philippians 2 passage, if you haven't memorized that, you should. That he considered, he didn't grasp onto everything, but gave it all up for, for the cross for us. Um, so here's the questions. The first was very basic. Do you, do you care for people? Do you just, do you like people? I mean, I mean all people. Do you see them as potential worshipers? Do you see them as potential brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do you have the subtle us versus them mentality? There's us who are on the right side of faith and politics and all, whatever it might be, culture, you know, things that are right and wrong. I remember when I went to Japan, same thing. I used to, you know, we went to Japan. We, we, we loved the Japanese people. We went there, and then we found that the Japanese people did things differently. And we didn't like it so much, right? <laughs> and there was this little bias. They just don't do it right. We have it all right, right? It, is that, it's, it can be subtle, right? It can be kind of mixture and love of this, that they're, they're different. So I don't love them as much. If you want to be effective, you have to love people. You have to be patient with people. You have to give your life for people that aren't nice. Remember Jesus said things like this. This is the principle. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you why is he saying that because everybody loves right people that we we like that are similar to us but it takes a, a spiritual transformation to love people enough to share the gospel even when they're persecuting you dragging you out of town stoning you throwing you off a cliff that's what paul did and he went back and back and back because he loved them so do you really love people? 
So if you have the wrong goal, you're not going to be able to adapt. But if you have the right goal, if you want to save people, if you want to be used by God in, in transforming lives and bringing people into the kingdom of God, if, if you want to partake in, in the benefits of the gospel, then you need to le learn to love people and adapt to them, even though they might be an idiot to you, for the sake of the gospel, right? Because probably, and I can bet with most of us, we were idiots to people who led us. I know I was. I was pretty stupid, right? In, in, a, um, in a mean way, the, the person initially tried to lead me to Christ, right? But I'm so thankful that he loved me despite my junk. And we can do the same. So the first thing is the idea of becoming all things to all people. Second thing is, is the concept of the Spirit's leading. Uh, this story is descriptive, not prescriptive. It's describing to us what happened to Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and, and Luke, right? It's not telling us that we should sit down and pray for a vision every time we want leading from God, right? That's not the pattern here. Uh, so it's descriptive, um, not prescriptive. But we can still draw some safe and helpful points about how to follow God as he leads us without ever receiving a divine vision in the night. We might, but don't count on it, right? God leads in different ways now that we have the scriptures, the New Testament. So, understand this, two things. God guides us through both closed doors and open doors. Okay? God guides us through both closed doors and open doors. And here's the caution. Right? And it's not in your outline, but maybe you should write it down. It's just important. Satan will deceive you through both open doors and closed doors. Right? So just because the door is open, we don't go, doo -doo -doo -doo, we don't just walk through it, right? Just because a door is closed, it doesn't mean we don't wiggle the handle, maybe it'll open, right? So we, so how do we discern? We discern through the, the, the Spirit of God and through the Scriptures, right? So God blocked Paul and his companions from going to Asia and Bithynia, but appealed to them to travel through to over to Macedonia. So in the first few instances, the missionaries get a divine no, don't go there. In the last, they get a divine yes, go there. So open doors, closed doors, God goes through both. This double guidance of God's restraining us and God prompting us typifies how God leads us. He'll lead us to a place where he says, hold off a bit, don't go now or at all, or hold back, whatever it is, timing could be an issue. I'll give you some examples. David Livingston, missionaries in the past. David Livingston wanted to go to China. That was, he wanted to go to China. And where did he go? Anybody know? Africa. Africa. So... Instead of China, he goes to Africa. William Carey, really the founder of modern missions, he wanted to go to Polynesia, but instead, he goes to, anybody know? India, right? Polynesia instead goes to India. Adoniram Judson. Every New Englander should know who Adoniram Judson is. Don't put your hands up. Does everybody know who Adoniram Judson is? No? All right. Everybody next week need to do a field trip. Go to Salem, Massachusetts. Go to the dock. There's a big... Thing there about Adoniram Judson and his family, the first missionaries from New England. Okay? First missionaries from New England. So they wanted to go to um, uh, India, right? Wanted to go to India, but instead they ended up going to Burma. And you had these other missionaries, Patty and Phil, who went to Japan, but instead they ended up in Dighton, Massachusetts. <laughs> right? And so God leads. God restrains, God changes, you follow the Spirit. So God both restrains us and he prompts us. He prevents us and he permits us. We follow his leading. We don't demand that God do it our way. God, I want to go to China. No, you're going to Africa. Well, I'm not going. Unless you go to China, I'm not going. No, you, you, you go to Africa, right? And then God uses you in a powerful way. So many times God's no is a way to prepare our hearts for something else. He'll say no sometimes and put us on hold so our heart is ready to do the thing that he in, wants us really to do. Sometimes he takes us out of the picture for a while. He sets us on the sideline so we learn something that we need to learn so we can go into a place of ministry where we have power rather than our brokenness will even cause more harm. So this is what Paul says, and I'll close with this, Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we, like I mentioned last week, if we know God's Word, if everyone in this congregation know, knew God's Word as well as someone like, like a pastor does, right? Because I have a lot of time to study. 
you should know God's word probably more than you do. I'm maybe being a little judgmental here, but my experience with church people, you probably, if you've been a Christian um, 40 years, you, you should know the scriptures very well. If, I, if, if you were a 40-year Christian and I go, please give me an outline of the book of Haggai, you should know. You should know. All right? if, if I ask you, um, you know, some basic Bible stuff, you should know. Because if you don't know those basic things, you can't be deceived. So if you can't, if you're not led by the, the, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is trying to lead you, many times the Holy Spirit leads you to the Word of God. Right? And so a lot of times I hear people, the Spirit told me to, and they say something that is like on the borderline of sinful, and I go, I, I don't think that was the Holy Spirit. Might, might have been your spirit, might have been some other spirit, but that probably wasn't the spirit. I'll give you one, just, 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 just I hear this all the time. Uh, young people dating uh, non-believers, right? Or businessmen getting uh, in uh, uh, business with a, a non-believer, right? The principle of Scripture is, is clear, right? There's darkness and light, and you should not be unequally yoked. But I hear all the time, I, uh, you know, I'm starting this business, and, uh, and, I, and God's really leading me to partner with this guy because he's really good at business, and I should probably partner with him because he has some, you know, some financial means, and it'll be good for my business. And, and I think God's telling me to do that. No, God's not telling you to do that. Absolutely not telling you to do that. Because right? God is not, not going to go against his word. Do not be unequally yoked. What's going to happen in that business is, this guy is going to have some principles of life that are going to affect the business, and you're going to have to make a decision. Do I compromise the kingdom principles for his principles or her principles? What's, what's, what's going to give? And so the Spirit leads us, but it leads us according to what the Scriptures say. So know the Scriptures and then be familiar with the Spirit's voice. If we live by the Spirit, if we know who he is, we, we are tuned to his voice rather than our own voices or the evil one or the world's voice, then we'll be able to keep in step with him. We'll be able to follow as he leads us. So adapt yourself for the sake of the gospel and be sensitive to spiritual leading, knowing the scripture. Without the scripture, we are lost. As disciples say, we, they, they clung to the words of Jesus because no one else, no one else had the words of life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to... Thank you for, first of all, for, for what you've done for us. Uh, all of us here, to some level or another, uh, who have made a commitment to you, Lord, at one time didn't know you. Uh, we, were, we were far from you. Whether that commitment came as a young, young person or, or later on in life, we all were separated for, from you. And you opened our eyes to the gospel that, that freed us from all the constraints of, of religion and ritual and brought us into this relationship with Jesus that brings life and freedom and life that's abundant and has impact now and also for eternity. And so, Father, we want to adapt our lives for the sake of that gospel that, that saved us, that changed us. We want to be like Paul, becoming all things to all people, that we might save some, that you might use us in, in, in turning a life around, that we might be your instruments, your ambassadors. Father, help us to be sensitive to your spirit as well, um, there are so many voices that are tempting us to, to lead us astray or to bring us different to a different place. And God, um, we, we need to, to learn to hear your voice. Your word says that your sheep hear your voice and, and recognize it. And we want to become more and more attuned to what you would say. Father, help us to fall in love with your word so that we would learn it more, so that we would be able to hear and be able to discern truth from falsehood all for the sake of the gospel, that we might partake in the benefits of it as well. And even now, Lord, as we, we go to the Lord's Supper, um, help us remind us of the very basic truths that we hold on to, that Jesus was crucified and buried, and three days later he rose to life. And, and if we place our faith in him, and we, we trust in that work on the cross, that we are saved. And you called us to take these two elements to remind us of that great sacrifice in history that changed us and changed history. We pray, God, that this time of the Lord's Supper would be an act of worship to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.